support we're giving to Cambridge University to see uh, youngsters come through and do PhDs. So we're acting at the, the top end of the industry and making sure that Britain remains at the centre of research into jewellery alloys and things like that. And I actually see Jack's book as one of these very high-end, erudite, brilliant uh, contributions to the top of understanding in our area. Now, I'd just like to explain a bit about Jack. Uh, I met him 18 years when I started here, and he was, uh, at the time, I think, the chief executive of JMA. Formerly, he was part of the, um, he was the chief executive of the NEJ. That's what I had. Before. Yeah, the, the NEJ, whatever they called it, before NEJ was in there, sorry. Uh, and, uh, uh, but one of the things that struck me is, is really the, um, expertise that he brings in so many areas. It's not just about diamonds as we saw today, it's about gemology and general old goals and uh, uh, very, very high level, interesting basic research that he's done personally and also contributed to the body of knowledge through the institutions that he's worked for. But the thing which really, really has me beat, really, and uh, I'd like to think I can compete with him in certain areas, but he hasn't changed in the 18 years that I've known him. He's still got a good head of hair, he's still the same colour, and he hasn't lost his sense of humour. Whereas myself, I've grown grey, I've become bitter and twisted and things like that. But um, uh, I'm really pleased that we could uh, work with Jack to offer this uh, event this evening, and I, I hope you all buy his book and, uh, <laughs> and enjoy this sort of thing. So I'm going to hand you now to Jack, who's promised he'll only be an hour and a half uh, in addressing us. But um, and, uh, please take the stage and. Uh, Thank you very much, Robert, uh, both for the introduction and also for you. For, you see, it was actually, we were having lunch and I mentioned the book was about to come out. So why don't we do a launch for it here? Oh, wow. Did I hear that right? And yeah, and it's, and it's worked out and uh, Robert and his, his team have done an amazing job organizing this. And so I'd like to thank Robert Organ and the girls in this company for allowing me to have this place here, and even more to invite all you lot. Um, so it's brilliant, many thanks indeed. Also, thank you for coming, all of you. Um, I know it's sort of an evening time. I mean, I haven't taken away from drinking time to be doing that, but it's your evening time, so I'm really grateful that you've actually put in time and come along here. And yeah, buy the book, wonderful, uh, but that's not the sell of that. But they, in the corner, they think it is. <laughs> <laughs> and it's the gross art of reason. Some of you know each other, some of you will meet who you haven't seen for years, and some of you will like new friends. Maybe even new enemies if you drink So, anyway, so first of all, thank everybody. And also, I want to thank all of you who have helped, helped with the book over the years. Uh, people that have provided photographs, provided information, uh, access to things, point me in directions of obscure things, whether it's an obscure photograph or an archive mention or whatever. So, thanks to the few people in the room. I can't name everybody, but to thank everybody who's been helpful in producing the book. Now, Robert said I didn't speak for an hour and a half. That's not true. That actually leaves time for questions. But uh, <laughs> uh, I'm just going to be a few minutes. And I thought I'd, I'd talk about the two main questions I get asked. So I've written a book on diamonds. So, and people say, the two questions that come out. One of them is, how long does it take? I've, I've already been asked that, I think, six times to see how long did it take me to write it? And when you want to know how long something is, you've got to know where it starts. And it's actually 45 years ago this year that I published an article on Roman imitation diamonds in the Journal of Gemology. So, in a sense, my interest in early diamonds goes back at least 45 years. The book itself hasn't been quite that length in time, but certainly for 15, 20, 20 years. My interest started when I learned about the, something that the East Indian Company were bringing in from the East. It was small, hard, extremely bad. It wasn't diamonds, it wasn't a girl's best friend, unless they liked macaroni and cheese and mild wine, but it was nutmeg. And there's a wonderful book, some of you might have read it, called Nathaniel's Nutmeg, which is the story of the basic the spice force in Indonesia, between the English and the Dutch, for the control of nutmeg trade. Anyway, reading this extraordinary, it's relevant, it's a wonderful book, so do read it. I'm 
going to read mine first. <laughs> um, and there were a few mentions in it to the East India Company bringing diamonds from Borneo. I thought I hadn't heard of diamonds from Borneo. So I did a bit of research and I then got, well, I couldn't get in deep, I got ended up in sort of the, what used to then be the India uh, office library, which now combined with the East British Library, looking through the East India Company documents and finding a lot of information about diamonds from India in the East India Company. And I got into it. I was really getting quite excited about this. And then a very good friend of mine, some of you are sure know, Tom called Benjamin Zoda, who I've known probably since the 70s, um, a gem expert, writer, dealer, lover of the arts, and a great friend. Um, I was talking to him about this. He said, that's really funny. He said, I've been doing some research on Yale. I don't know who Yale, who in the 1680s was governor in Madras, the East India Company. And he was making a little bit of um, money on the side, diamond dealing. It wasn't quite illegal, it wasn't quite legal, but he made a lot of money on the side. And with these ill-gotten gains, or part of them, he had just endowed a university in America, which is now known as Yale University. I think they're not so sure, but I think anywhere on the website they mentioned it came from illicit diamond dealing. But anyway, that's, um, <laughs> anyway, so Benjamin was, um, we thought, well, let's do a joint book on Yale and the history of the Indian diamond trade. And that's where we started, and we were sort of chugging along this line for a few years. And then he got more and more interested in Yale as an individual and Yale's own collection of art, which is quite an important art collection, which is quite well documented. So we were going slightly differently. So we decided, totally amicably, for spirit, I would write my book on diamonds, and he'd write his book, which he eventually did the Diamonds Carriage Book on Yale, which came out before mine, um, but it, anyway, it's a great book, and then mine. So anyway, that's the, the how long is it taken? It's taken, well, quite a long time. I mean, it's not full time. I have had real jobs. I say it took all my time, and generally, I wonder what the hell I was doing for them. So, no, I mean, but on and off, it's taken a long time. The second great question everybody asks me is not sort of what about the French medieval archives, or what, how do you interpret Pliny's comments on diamonds? It's not that. It says, is diamond an engagement ring? Is that just a beer's marketing? <laughs> and that's what they are. And in fact, I had an email the other day. Somebody who knows our published book, the email came, the question was quite simply, is a diamond really worth a month's salary? <laughs> so I thought, well, I'll, I'll reply, it'll be really topical. So I just wrote back and said, are you talking about a man's salary or a woman's salary? <laughs> 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 no, actually, I didn't actually say that, but I was very tempted. <laughs> Um, the answer is actually love with connection does get back a long way. The earliest mention of diamond ring as a love gift, um, uh, Roman author Dugan, he talks about this, in 100, give or take a few weeks, 100 AD, in December, I know the date and the month, but not actually the year, it's not recorded, but in December, a merchant in Rome was offering for sale a diamond ring, which had been given by Agrippa II to his lover. That's great. The beers is a sign of a market. Well, he didn't actually, because his lover was his sister. It was quite a scandal at the time. That's really <laughs> not what we want um, in the debate advertising. But anyway, if you jump forward a thousand years or so, you get quite a lot of that diamonds. Once you get into about sort of 1400s, later 1300s, you start to see diamonds as love well, gifts. And most of these are Italian. You get these rings with inscriptions. They're quite charming inscriptions about love. But there again, we're in a British institution here, nice old one. We said the earliest record I actually found of this was from a will of uh, this is 17, 17 uh, sorry 1417 woman died and her will mentions her diamond ring and inside was engraved I love you with all my heart that's 1417 which I think is the earliest sort of British reference to diamond as a love thing. Now of course this whole question of engagement rings and diamonds and love and all this sort of stuff can come around to sounding slightly sexist. I mean, always, this thing's always a puzzle me. When a man gives a woman a diamond ring, is he endowing her with his worldly wealth, or is he buying her? Yeah. It's an interesting question, that one. I won't go further into that one. But, um, you all know this. Friend. What she really meant was, 
a guy with diamonds or money for diamonds was a girl's best friend. And this does have sort of slightly non-modern sexist terms to it. So I thought we should try and counterbalance this this evening as we have a mixed audience here. And it's quite an interesting story. A son called William Hawkins, who was working for the East India Company in the 1600s, he went out to negotiate with Jahangir, um, trade for the East India Company. And from his writing, you get a huge amount of information about diamond trade at the time. But the interesting thing was, he arrived, this Englishman, called Jahangir, the great Mughal emperor, and then he said, you should have a wife. So he says, well, um, I'm not sure about this. I don't know exactly what wasn't there. But they, you know, sort of basically, they're trying to go, yes, I'll, I'll find you a woman. So, well, so if there's any way out of this one, so he says, I can't, because I can only marry a Christian. I think this is no problem, and produces this gorgeous Armenian girl who's Christian. Um, William Hawkins agrees. <laughs> Don't look at Gitchels and Ralph and all that stuff. So, so he married this gorgeous Armenian girl, and we're now heading back to England. Um, in 1613, heading back to England, and unfortunately, William Hawkins died on the voyage. <laughs> and so his Armenian wife ended up in England, and the quote here is, she was left alone among strangers in a strange land. It was more gloomy, because she also had diamonds with her. It's recorded that she had some 6,000 pounds worth of diamonds. And that's probably, what, six million in modern terms? More. More than that. So, a lot of money. And so, to carry on the quote, she had no difficulty in finding another English husband. <laughs> <laughs> the lucky man, the lucky, the lucky man here was somebody called Gabriel Towson. And coincidentally, he had actually also worked at the Eastern Company and been on the same boat home where William had died. I think there's probably a movie or a novel in this one somewhere, but the East Indian Company rebels don't cover it in depth. Anyway, so they went back to India, a happy couple, and he then gets posted further east, Indonesia. And he was one of the Englishmen killed in the massacre of Boyana in 1623 by the Dutch, brutal massacre, one of the most notorious events in the nutmeg wars. So we're actually back where we started here with nutmeg. Um, so research does go around in circles sometimes. You start off, you go around, but then any good journey, you, you hope you can end up home at the end. So you do go around in circles and research and come back. So the, the book, I suppose, is, is, is an attempt to try and lay down the early history of diamonds up to 1725, when the sort of Brazil was found and everything changes and it gets much more hectic. So it's an early story, the earliest times through to 1725, it will take a week. And I hope it will be a useful contribution to understanding of diamonds and their history, and understanding what the Roman author Pliny uh, called the Gem of Kings, and a thousand years later, the Persian Al-Bruni said, the King of Gems. Thank you very much indeed.